It is um, a busy day, and I am especially thankful to uh, Ambassador William Swink to really admiring his stamina, being capable to stay almost uh, uh, 24 hours on duty and uh, honoring us with his um, presence. Uh, unnecessary presentation of his personality and his role for this organization. Please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Archbishop. Uh, Yurkovich, uh, a strong supporter of IOM and a good friend, uh, thank you very much. It's an honor to be asked to be part of uh, this very important panel. And I apologize at the beginning that I'm also at the same time co-hosting a lunch for a number of our, <laughs> a number of our guests, so I will bow out at, at, a, at, what, at some point here. Uh, I will also, His Eminence, thank you very much, sir. So I've been looking forward to meeting you for a long time. It's a great honor to share the podium with you here. Look, I'm going to throw away the, the text that I had. It's a good text, but I don't want to read from anything. It's lunch hour, and I know a lot of you had a long morning. I'd like to speak a little bit from the heart, if I may. Um, I think that integration is probably certainly one of the most critical elements in any uh, successful migration. And it's one of the ones that is the most neglected. And frankly, in today's toxic atmosphere, we have a lot of hard work to do to put this back into the right place. Um, so much of it involves preparation. Um, it is um, not something that happens automatically or that is a given. People look different, speak different, uh, have different uh, customs. Uh, it's always that fear of the other out there that we have to deal with. If we don't deal with it, we put people's lives into danger and we deny ourselves the important contribution that migrants are going to make. They've always made. Historically, migration has always been overwhelmingly positive. So we need not only to support integration, we need to embrace it. Diversity is a value in itself. And I know you know all of this, but I'm, I'm just saying to you because right now we're in great difficulty. If you consider all of the terrorist attacks we've had recently in Europe and say in the Western world, Paris, Nice, Brussels, Barcelona, San Bernardino, California, Orlando, Florida, and probably some I've forgotten, they were all homegrown. These were people who were citizens. They weren't people who arrived on our shores yesterday people who felt marginalized, rejected, not socially included. And so there's a lot, there's a lot riding on the question of, of, of doing integration. And I think of many countries, I see the ambassador of Germany here, Germany, I think doing a fantastic job of trying to get people into language classes, to get them into jobs, and those who don't qualify, making sure that they're able to return in dignity, not in rejection. Um, I have enormous admiration for what um, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau did when he asked uh, IOM in December of 2015, when I was in Ottawa, could we bring back 25,000 uh, Syrians uh, to Canada by the, could we do it in, in, by the end of February? And we said, well, we'll try. And we think if anybody can do it, we can do it. But what he did was he sent his minister of migration out to all of the provinces and the big cities and laid out for them a program of integration. Here's what's expected of you. Shelter, a job, language learning, uh, communication with the community because it's a two-way street. It's not just we have to help the community to adjust to the migrant and the migrant to adjust to the community. 
And it was done so well that in the end, they had more families asking for another Syrian refugee to take care of. They didn't have enough to go around, in effect. So I'm just saying a couple of examples. You have uh, opening up, inter opening up uh, uh, public services. Now, you can argue that they're coming here to exploit our public services, to take money away from hard-earned uh, the taxpayers' dollars. It may well be true, but ask yourself a question and make one conclusion. The question is, do you want unhealthy migrants, which will make unhealthy communities? <laughs> do you want uneducated migrant brats? Or do you want migrant children who will grow up in an educational system and will make at least as good a contribution, maybe more, than the child who was born uh, in the community. So it's, there's a national interest in doing this, um, in doing all of this um, uh, uh, properly. Um, so I think that there's a lot to be learned from those experiences. I think of countries like Thailand, Morocco recently, King Mohammed VI, the fourth, fourth anniversary of his policy. They've all opened up the public services invited people in, open up the job market. So I, a lot of this is self-evident, but we have to understand that people out there do have fears, and I think it's important that we, that we help them with their fears by showing them the contributions that migrants make. We are conducting a program now called I Am a Migrant. We've interviewed 500 or 600 migrants. We let them tell their own story. And that is the, probably one of the best ways to counter the very poisonous atmosphere in which migration takes place and very often where integration does not take place. So I, I think there's probably a lot more I could say, but we've got a large panel and you've got more important voices than mine here. But I wanted just to share these thoughts with you because I think this is, this is a major part of it. There's a major challenge. And if we don't get this one right, we'll be asking for much more trouble. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador Swain, for setting the scene, which is certainly capable to allocate all the considerations we are going to do during this session. I certainly appreciate very much that you could find the time to stay with us and give to our to our uh, event a real uh, somehow institutional me meaning, I would say, because uh, the conviction of uh, the Holy See, the Catholic Church, of the Pope personally, to stand close to the ideas that is inspiring also your organization is very strong. Thank you. So I now give, have the honor to give the floor to His Eminence Reinhard Cardinal Marx, Archbishop of Munich and Freising, and President of the German Bishops' Conference. He's also President of the U, uh, U, Bishops' Conferences of European Union. His, uh, he will deliver a speech on, uh, keynote speech on participation and inclusion, the commitment of the Catholic Church to integration. His Eminence, after studying theology and philosophy in Germany and France and being ordained a priest, became director of Comende and then professor of Catholic social teaching in the Faculty of Theology of Paderborn. After becoming consecrated bishop, he was appointed to Trier in 2001 and to Munich and Freising in 2008. In 2013, he was appointed to the Council of Cardinals and became coordinator of the Economic Council of the Vatican uh, with a big visibility and big interest of public uh, of media, as you know. His Eminence Cardinal Marx was elected president of the Commission of the Bishops' Conference of the European Community in 2012 and is president of the German Bishops' Conference uh, since 2014. Your Eminence, I may thank you for being with us today and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it, was, it is with great pleasure that I address this meeting of uh, distinguished representatives. 
I would like to express my gratitude to the permanent mission of the Holy See, to the United Nations in Geneva, the permanent mission of the Order of Malta, the International Catholic Migration Commission, and the Caritas in Veritate Foundation for having organized this event. Since our gathering takes place on the sidelines of the 108th Council of the International Organization of Migration, thank you for your presence. I would also like to extend my best regards and wishes to the delegates and participants of the IOM Council. In our time, religious and political leaders alike have an increased responsibility to address urging matters of integration. We heard this from Ambassador Swing. At the UN General Assembly in September 2016, the heads of state and government gave a pledge to develop, I quote, national policies relating to integration in conjunction with relevant civil society organizations including faith-based organizations, end of quotation. At the same time, they initiated an important consultation and negotiation process which aims in the achievement, at the achievement of two global compacts in 2018, one on refugees, the other on safe, orderly and regular migration. We discussed it also yesterday during this wonderful uh, event at table. The issue of integration is at the heart of many of the questions that will be dealt with in this context. And I can assure you that the Catholic Churches and the Catholic Church in Germany, but all over the world, is more than willing to make significant contributions to these efforts, both at national and global levels. The Nuncio mentioned the Holy Father. As controversial as our discussions about the most promising integration policies may be, they should be guided by a clear idea of participation and inclusion. What does that mean? In his message for the World Day of Migrants and Refugees 2018, Pope Francis calls for a quote, a determined effort to ensure that all migrants and refugees, as well as the communities which, will, uh, which welcome them, are empowered to achieve their potential as human beings in all the dimensions which constitute the humanity intended by the Creator. Quotation end. That must be the common ground of our policy. That's a, religions, a religious argumentation, but it's also open for all the people who have not, are not following uh, the, the, the Christian faith, that there is a common ground for every human being. That's very important, otherwise we will have separation in, 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 in nations and races and all these terrible things of the past. That is to say, we are summoned to promote the development of every person, irrespective of their specific status. Such an approach requires a far-reaching change of perception. Also, Ambassador Swing mentioned it. Migrants, asylum seekers, and refugees should not be regarded as passive suppliants begging for favors only. Instead, we should more often than not see them as persons who dare a new beginning who are eager to advance the well-being of themselves, of their families, and of the communities they live in. Most people easily agree on three keys to successful, successful, uh, successful integration, language, education, and work. But we have to, to do more than just paying lip service to uncontroversial general claims. Judging from the situation in my country, I have the impression that there is by and large a sufficient degree of goodwill. We were surprised about these thousands of people who are, who are engaged in the, in the work with the migrants and the refugees. 
Yet, when it comes to taking tangible steps, there are often still too many obstacles and hurdles. Migrants sink into frustration or even hopelessness because they are not granted access to adequate language and integration courses or to higher education and training programs, also to work when it is possible. Because they face grave difficulties with the validation of their educational and professional qualifications, because they are not given a fair chance in the labor market. One source of problems is in this area is the distinction between those who are expected to stay for a longer period of time and those who are anticipated to leave in the foreseeable, foreseeable future. Also in Germany, we have this discussion. In some instances, instances this distinction may be justified, but, what, but whenever it is possible, we should strive to overcome it. There's not helping us in a real in the real sense to help these people and to give them a chance. Those who return home after a while can utilize, utilize the skills and experience gained in our country for the benefit of their societies. In this manner, measures which were originally meant to enhance integration in our country can also have a favorable effect on the development of other countries. What matters is that every person is given a real opportunity to advance and use their skills and competences, whether they live in, in a society temporarily or permanently. This is not simply a question of prudence, but also of principle. By engaging in meaningful activities, we make use of our God-given abilities and even, and even take part in the work of creation. As Pope John Paul II expressed in his encyclical Laborem Exercens, I quote, man created in the image of God shares by his work in the activity of the creator. Catholic social teaching thus makes us sensitive to the wider anthropological dimension. If we truly recognize every person's dignity, we cannot force them to live in passivity and without their families. The genuine empowerment of migrants is a decisive step towards successful integration. Empowerment, one of the key lines of, of our um, ideas. There is, however, more to the idea of participation and inclusion. What is essential is some sense of belonging, a consciousness of being part of a community. Perhaps that's better than the word integration. Integration is sometimes, uh, you mentioned it, it's a difficult word, and you must explain, explain, explain. But the, the, the line is to, to, to be part of something, to be, in, uh, to be inclusive, to, to belong to a community, to be part of it, and to have the chance to, to, to become part of, of a community. That is uh, very important. Both among the local population and among migrants, a shared responsibility for the common good needs to involve. Such a joint commitment must go beyond the basic requirement of law abidance. It has to be driven by mutual recognition and mutual esteem. The host society can certainly expect migrants to respect its values and to appreciate its heritage, but this should not be a one-way road. Rather, members of the host society on their part ought to receive migrants with sincere appreciation. In his apostolic exhortation Evangelii Gaudium, Pope Francis characterizes such an attitude as a, I quote, a generous openness which, rather than fearing the loss of local identity, will prove capable of creating new forms of cultural synthesis. To this end, a mutual readiness to become acquainted with so far unknown perspectives, experiences, and customs is necessary. Just like the success of integration processes is the fruit of two-sided efforts, there is also mutual momentum in the failure of integration. That is to say, in many cases, failed integration cannot solely be attributed to the 
lack of willingness on the side of migrants. Rather, the host society as well needs to ask itself whether it is making sufficient efforts to value foreigners, sometimes in spite of differences, sometimes because of them. To be, to be sure, such an attitude of generous openness must not be confused with naivete or relativism. The respect of the dignity of every human being, the right to life and physical integrity, the equality of men and women, freedom of religion, freedom of expression, these are some of the core values which are not up for negotiation, but which are the very prerequisites for an inclusive society. Nor should generous openness be taken to imply the denial of one's own cultural and religious roots. When Europeans receive migrants from other parts of the world, there is no reason to understate the strong imprint which Christianity has had and still has on the identity of our continent. Like in Bavaria, However, one needs to resist the tendency of turning positive identities into negative identities. Identity is not against another one. That is not the identity I, I prefer. Identity is open to receive also others. At times, the recourse to human rights or to Christianity or to other elements constitu cons constitutive of our societies is simply misused as an instrument of exclusion. That's not the way a right identity uh, can, can, can brought in. This happens when the values we rightfully cherish are not brought to life in an inviting and inspiring manner, but are treated as rigid demarca demarcation lines. This is us and that is you. And between us, there is an insurmountable trench, a mountable trench. Such discourses of separation are typically the symptom of a deep uncertainty about one's own identity and belonging. Whenever tendencies, tendencies of segregation occur, be they mental or material, the church is called to be at the service of a difficult dialogue uh, to quote from Pope Francis, he said, that is not the way we uh, save our identity and, and, and make separations and uh, being against others. The challenge we are facing is, as a matter of fact, integration in a wide-ranging sense. Participation and inclusion are of concern not only for newly arriving immigrants, but also for citizens and long-time residents. In our European societies, a significant number of people do not experience themselves as valued members of a community and do not feel empowered to contribute to the common good. It is, uh, the, it is against this background that the German bishops gave a clear assurance in their guidelines for the church commitment to refugees. I quote, the church defends the interest of all disadvantaged people because they said you are only uh, looking on the, on, the, on the refugees, what is about the others in our country, and so on. No, we said the church defends the interests of all disadvantaged people. The church's commitment to the many people who are marginalized within our society is to be continued with unreduced energy. The church's manifold activities in the field of migration must be regarded as part and parcel of a comprehensive commitment to the well-being of society. We have to oppose any tendencies of playing off one marginalized group against the other group, to bring them against each other. That's one of the dangers. People in need should feel assured that the church is at their side, regardless of their origin and background. But the challenge is even more vexing. Those who feel threatened by migration and those who engage in a discourse of separation are not always necessarily the ones who have really been left behind. In some instances, we can detect a worrying attitude among the established 
and well-to-do, an inclination to defend, to defend one's own cultural and economic privileges at the cost of nurturing prejudices against migrants and disparaging people in search of protection. I think it is no exaggeration to perceive in such a hardening of hearts the signs of an ethical and even spiritual drought. This ling language of, of exclusion has always in history been and is also today dangerous for a common future of our societies. And, is, and this language of exclusion is back again in our societies. When sentiments of a shared humanity are lacking, the church must not remain silent. As Pope Francis reminds us, our Christian commitment is driven by a deeper spiritual motivation. I quote, Jesus Christ is always waiting to be rec recognized in migrants and refugees, in displaced person, persons and in exiles. And through, them, and through them, he calls us to share our resources and occasionally to give up something of our acquired riches. We live up to this call not only through words, but also through concrete actions. The numerous Christians all over the world who are committed to the needs of migrants and refugees testify to a living culture of acceptance and solidarity. In Germany, more than 100,000 Catholic volunteers and approximately 6,000 employees of the church and of Catholic organizations are active in this field. It's a large number, and they're still there. They don't give up. The commitment of church initiatives and civil societies groups is not intended to replace government efforts. efforts. But many times, such grassroots activities succeed in something that cannot be mandated by law. They create spaces of encounter where people experience personal care and affection. One particularly interesting approach in this regard is the strengthening of practical interreligious cooperation. Very difficult, but we have to try it. We have to go forward in it. In 2016, the German Bishops' Conference contributed to launching a nationwide, nationwide program which fosters the cooperation of Jewish, Christian, and Muslim communities. The underlying idea is that Members of local synagogues, church parishes, and mosques join forces in giving aid to refugees and in promoting integration. Such models of cooperation face, without a doubt, challenges and difficulties, but they are worth every effort. Experience teaches us that true solidarity requires empathy, and empathy comes from encounter, from meeting, from seeing the other. Those who have never been forced to leave their homeland are called to see the world through the eyes of the other. And such a change of perspective must not result in fatalism or indifference, but has to give rise to a willingness to promote the inclusion of those on the margins. As Catholics, we belong to a church of all languages and of all peoples. We are convinced that the definition of the common good of a given society may never be detached, detached from the common good of the entire human family. You cannot have the common good for one society without looking on the common good of the family of human beings. In order to promote this objective, even in ancient times, international cooperation and international exchange are more necessary than ever before. And in this sense, we as Christians want to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. Thank you very much for your attention. Your evidence, thank you so much. It is exactly what you said today that uh, is on the base of our special event. We wanted to show not that much also to testify the positive experiences, but also to show that the 
the, the, the resolute, that we are resolute to continue on this this way. It is uh, how to say what, as you said, church is in service of a big dialogue. This is exactly what we are doing here, Your, uh, Your Eminence, in this very prestigious and uh, very professional environment, and very useful, probably much more than in the media uh, can be perceived. You said church defends the interests of all disadvantaged, people who are disadvantages. So this, the other thing is that we would like to show this. We are, by defending also promoting and standing behind the global compact, we are exactly doing this. We are spotting many, many uh, brothers and sisters who are in absolutely impossibly difficult situation and we stay behind that. We are fighting language of exclusion we are. We would like to be example of living acceptance, as you said, through hundreds and thousands of uh, volunteers in your country, which is a big country, important country with many means, also with big Christian and big religious communities and big Catholic community, as your does. And also, we were very much, I would say, inspired also by this suggestion of having, in the country of acceptance, already a beginning of interreligious dialogue that will bring new fruits and will prepare all those who are, how to say, have to learn how to live in the new environment. Everybody has to learn how to live in the new environment. And probably the interreligious dialogue is one of those very important elements that we are a capable and we can offer in today's uh, difficult moment in our societies. So Your Eminence, thank you so much. After this um, um, uh, keynote speech, we will have now a panel. Uh, each panelist will have about seven minutes to present uh, his or her speech, which will then be followed by a short statement of some co-organized and co-sponsoring state. So the first panelist is uh, Mr. El Habib Nadir, Secretary General of Ministry delegate to the Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation in charge of Moroccans living abroad and migration affairs and co-chair of the Global Forum on Migration and Development. In this moment, I would like to thank your embassy here, your Chaché d'Affaires, who is so generously collaborating with us and helping us to have you with us, because we wanted to have you exactly as another voice uh, to give credit also to our voice as we are somehow complementary looking, uh, we are part of the world that needs this complementarity, and we appreciate very much your presence here. So please, you have the floor, and we are uh, looking forward to listen to you. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur le Moderateur. Mes remerciements vont à la mission permanente du Saint-Siège et à tous les organisateurs de cet événement qui euh, a associé donc le Maroc pour contribuer au débat sur la gouvernance des migrations de manière générale et à cette question de l'intégration en particulier. L'intégration des migrants, et on part de ce postulat, est bénéfique à la fois au pays d'accueil, au pays d'origine, et aux migrants eux-mêmes. Pour les pays d'accueil, la diversité crée la richesse, apporte de l'innovation, permet aux entreprises d'élargir leur marché, d'avoir des innovations. Et tout à l'heure, un représentant de l'Italie avait donné un chiffre éloquent, c'est que la migration contribue en Italie à hauteur de 8% de la croissance de ce pays. Ce n'est pas négligeable. 3% de la migration internationale contribue à hauteur, je crois qu'il y a des études de la Banque mondiale qui parlent de 10%, donc 3% de la population qui contribue à 10% de la création des richesses. Pour les pays d'origine, vous le savez, donc, la migration bénéficie dans le transfert des compétences, des diasporas, leur retour pour investir dans les pays, mais également les transferts de fonds comme quelque chose de plus, de plus concret. Partant de ce constat, pour la migration et euh, l'intégration est bénéfique pour tous, 
elle est aussi la responsabilité partagée de tous, partagée entre pays d'accueil, pays d'origine et les migrants eux-mêmes. Je crois que les différentes parties doivent conjuguer leurs efforts pour comprendre l'autre. Euh, quand je ne vous comprends pas, quand je ne comprends pas vos spécificités, je risque de me tromper sur le regard que je porte sur vous et sur notre manière de vivre, de vivre ensemble. Donc je crois que c'est des efforts mutuels entre ces différentes parties qui doivent être, qui doivent être faits. Et de la part des migrants, il doit comprendre ses droits et ses devoirs pour vivre dans une société qu'il a accueillie. À partir de là, l'intégration devient une affaire de toutes les composantes de la société. D'abord, les États, qui sont responsables de la création des conditions et des opportunités pour d'abord l'accès aux services de base, qui est un droit fondamental, mais également de toutes les conditions qui permettent de libérer le potentiel des migrants. Un migrant est une force, un migrant est une compétence, est une ressource que le pays d'accueil doit, euh, euh, entre guillemets, exploiter. C'est le rôle également des élus locaux, parce que c'est là où se passent euh, les actions sur le terrain. C'est le rôle de la société civile d'accompagner par des actions de proximité. C'est le rôle également des médias pour promouvoir un discours positif et non euh, 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 se focaliser sur la stigmatisation des migrants. C'est le rôle des élus de faire des efforts pédagogiques pour expliquer et rassurer les populations euh, euh, qui sont dans le, dans le désarroi. Et c'est le rôle des, des autorités religieuses qui ont un rôle central pour véhiculer un discours de la sagesse pour contrecarrer ce discours de haine, de repli identité, de xénophobie, etc. C'est un discours, les discours qu'on a aujourd'hui, qui associe le migrant au terroriste, qui associe le migrant au trafiquant de, 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 de tout genre, qui associe le migrant comme origine de tous les maux de, 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 des sociétés et des difficultés qu'ils vivent. Donc ils ont ce rôle de dialogue entre, entre religions et surtout de véhiculer ces discours de, de, de la sagesse. J'ai lu avec beaucoup d'intérêt les 20 points d'action euh, sur les réfugiés et les migrants euh, élaborés par l'Église catholique et euh, je trouve qu'elles sont euh, inspirées de valeurs d'accueil, de protection, de générosité qui font la force des sentiments religieux. Ça devrait inspirer euh, d'autres parties à, 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 à trouver les voies pour... Euh, cette question donc, de, de gouvernance de la migration et d'intégration. Nous avons mené au Maroc, et là je vais parler du cas du Maroc rapidement, des consultations nationales sur le pacte mondial, juste pour faire un exercice pédagogique avec toutes les parties prenantes, universitaires, sociétés civiles, migrants eux-mêmes. Et les recommandations qui sortaient de ces consultations nationales rejoignent dans beaucoup d'entre elles les 20, les 20 points d'action. C'est pour dire qu'aujourd'hui, il y a un consensus sur un certain nombre de principes, notamment le principe de respect des droits des migrants en tant que personnes humaines. Le Maroc, il y a quatre ans, a lancé une politique migratoire face au flux de migrants qui traversaient le Maroc pour passer en Europe et avec le durcissement des, 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 de la gestion des frontières européennes. Beaucoup ont choisi de de rester au Maroc et donc à partir de là, nous avons travaillé sur un vaste programme d'intégration qui a suivi d'abord deux opérations de régularisation. Régulariser un migrant, c'est lui donner ce papier peut-être euh, administratif, mais il est très symbolique parce que c'est à partir de là qu'il peut euh, chercher dignement un travail sans avoir toujours cette préoccupation d'être régulier ou pas. Donc régulariser toutes les femmes et tous les enfants, et ça c'est un geste humanitaire de, de solidarité. Et puis l'accès aux services de base, et là je vais m'arrêter à un service que je considère très important, c'est l'éducation. Aujourd'hui, si on n'ouvre pas l'école aux enfants des migrants, nous allons hériter demain des jeunes mal éduqués ou sous-éduqués peut-être exploité par d'autres. Si ce n'est pas l'État qui le fait, d'autres le feront à notre place, à leur manière et dans leur, dans leur intérêt. Je crois que si on n'ouvre pas les écoles, 
euh, aux enfants des migrants. Quel que soit le statut migratoire, un enfant, il, un enfant reste un enfant. Hein, il n'est pas responsable de, de, de sa migration légale ou, ou, ou illégale. Il y a l'apprentissage de la langue, la langue locale. Si on veut de la mixité et avoir une compréhension mutuelle, il faut qu'on se parle la, la, la même langue. Au Maroc, nous avons euh, ouvert les écoles, mais nous avons également dispensé les enfants de cours d'éducation islamique euh, obligatoire pour les enfants marocains. Ça, c'est un geste peut-être anodin, mais ça permet de mettre à l'aise l'autre. C'est obligatoire pour les Marocains, mais pour un enfant de confession autre que musulmane, il n'a pas à subir euh, des, des, des cours et des examens qui, qui ne... Nous avons aussi aidé les migrants à se constituer en association, parce que intégrer les migrants, c'est les écouter, c'est les associer, associer eux-mêmes à tout ce qu'on fait, euh, qu fait pour eux. Voilà. Je vais, je vais euh, avant, avant de conclure, euh, citer une, une anecdote euh, de manière... Euh, euh, notre, notre équipe nationale de football aujourd'hui, elle est constituée en majorité de jeunes euh, issus de parents qui ont émigré du Maroc il y a, donc qui vivent en France, en Allemagne, etc. Le jour où on aura une équipe nationale avec des enfants ici de l'immigration au Maroc, je crois qu'on aura en partie réussi l'intégration, l'intégration des migrants. Et c'est pas, et c'est pas loin d'être d'être de la de, de la réalité. Je vais conclure avec un message qui est le suivant. Je crois que nous sommes aujourd'hui en train d'abandonner les valeurs humaines de solidarité, de partage, de respect mutuel, parce que nous avons cédé à ces discours populistes de haine, de repli identitaire. La migration est devenue aujourd'hui dans beaucoup de pays, de grands pays, euh, qui devaient donner et montrer la voie aux autres. Elle est devenue un enjeu euh, électoral. C'est une régression et il est temps d'agir et de réagir. Nous sommes tous interpellés, religieux, élus, techniciens, société civile, organisations internationales, médias, etc. Ensemble, nous pourrons faire de la migration un levier de développement pour tous. Merci. Thank you, Your Excellency. It is exactly, I think, what you said and what we are hearing today repeatedly. We, we are all growing in, um, and getting more mature and more um, capable to understand things that is certainly, how to say, in, in itself a very in, in use and uh, it's a normal phenomenon, but it's very, very big phenomenon, not easy to explain to the society. I think that what we can do and what especially, let's say, from the part of our religious organization, we have to do this work of presenting the real face of migration. How to say, avoid everything that can intoxicate a real consideration, a serious consideration, historical, philosophical, and also theological. And I think we are, this is our duty, and this is why we, we are so uh, thankful to you that you came to show us, with in other words, the same reality, the same challenge. It will be necessary to educate, to speak for years to come, and to repeat it again and again, as it is necessary to say good things ten, once, twice, thrice, always, every day. So thank you so much for being with us and sharing with us really the efforts, very important efforts of your nation and also very big sensibility that you have personally in your specific responsibilities. Thank you. So next panelist, our next panelist will be Ambassador Stefan de Boer, permanent representative of Canada to the WTO in Geneva. He has an incredible, interesting personal curriculum vitae. I don't know whether I should read it, but I would say for our, for our event, it is important to have somebody who had experience somehow in the business uh, environment, a diplomatic environment, traveling in many parts of the world, also recently Eastern Europe. So Ambassador was so happy to be with us and, and uh, so it was your embassy that we contacted at the beginning. We wanted to have you as uh, one of the strong pillars together with German embassy and the Moroccan embassy to start these conversations. So thank you for being with us and we are listening to you.
Thank you very much, uh, Your Eminence, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Per me, permit me to set out for you and, and talk a little bit about Canada and Canada's immigration experience. Canada is a country that is shaped by immigration. Immigrants have built Canada's economy as well as shaped its social and cultural fabric. And this issue in this story is of particular interest to me as the child of immigrants. Today, one-fifth of Canada's population, 21.9%, were born outside of Canada, including my parents. Immigrants make up more than one-fifth of the total labor force. As a consequence of demographic shifts in the Canadian population, immigrants are expected to account for all net labor force growth within the next de decade and for almost 80% of net population growth by 2030. Looking to the future, it is very clear that we will continue to rely on immigration and refugees to help build a dynamic society and a thriving economy. In Canada, we believe that the diversity of our population is a great source of strength. In fact, we have studied this and found this to be the case. And that diverse communities experience better social cohesion, greater respect for human rights, and notable civic and cultural benefits. In generation after generation, we have seen immigrants, refugees, and their descendants become tremendously productive members of our country and make meaningful and varied contributions to our society, our economy, our communities, and our cultural life. Our own Minister of Immigration was a refugee himself, who became highly educated as a lawyer, contributing to the private sector, and now in the political arena. So what is our immigration model? We practice what we call managed migration. Each year, the federal government decides how many people will enter the country as permanent residents. This approach balances economic, social, and humanitarian objectives. Canada has a strong commitment to its humanitarian goals by resettling refugees, either as government-assisted refugees, privately sponsored refugees, or blended visa office referred refugees. Many asylum seekers have also been successful refugee claimants, that is, refugees landed in Canada. In 2017, Immigration Levels Plan maintains a strong commitment to protecting those in need with a target of 40,000 refugees. Well, less than in 2016, this is double compared to historical levels in the last decade, which was an average of 20,000 to 25,000, or 10% of total admissions. The level's planning includes consultations with provinces and territories, security partners and stakeholders, other governments, and the public. This whole of society approach, combined with an emphasis on protecting and consulting the public and growing the economy, is one way that Canada builds public confidence in its approach to immigration. We believe that the successful integration of all immigrants, including refugees, provides our country with great opportunities and a competitive advantage. To this end, the federal government places a high priority on the effective settlement and integration of newcomers. Through inclusive laws and policies on investments in settlement and integration services, the federal government helps to set an inclusive and enabling environment for su successful immigrant integration. The cornerstone of this approach is Canada's model of immigrate, immigrant immig integration, which is premised on social inclusion and mutual adaptation by newcomers and societal actors, what we refer to as a two-way approach. The federal government invests almost 350, sorry, 650 million outside of Quebec on settlement services via more than 500 third-party organizations across Canada to permanent residents and protected persons, including refugees, in order to support their successful settlement and integration into Canada. Employment-related services are one of the five direct program components of the settlement program residing with the federal government. Other settlement programming includes information and orientation, needs assessment and referrals, language training, and community connections. The federal government also works with provinces and territories to coordinate efforts to improve 
the labor market access of immigrants, including refugees, including foreign credential recognition so they can apply their skills in the Canadian marketplace. Provincial and territory governments are also key partners in, in ensuring immigrants and refugees have the basic supports to integration, such as health, education, and social services. Labor market attachment is both a key indicator and an important contributor to newcomers' successful integration to Canada. Current employment-related settlement services typically include one or a combination of the following services. Work placement, including internships, paid or unpaid, practice firms and other direct work experience opportunities. Mentoring, including speed mentoring or a traditional link with professionals in the client's field of expertise or interest. Preparation for licensure and certification, services that are meant to help clients meet the licensing requirements in their field for the purposes of licensure. Networking opportunities, structured activities and events that allow clients to be present in an environment with professional peers and potential employers to increase their professional networks. This may include job fairs, meet and greets, and information nights. And employment consulting, counseling services, a direct one-on-one -on -one counseling to clients on pathways to employment. By international comparisons, Canada is at the top of OECD countries when considering immigrants' economic outcomes. Recent evidence shows that immigrants in Canada continue to have the most equitable outcomes in the labour market in terms of job quality, unemployment rates and earnings. Immigrants also successfully contribute to Canada's social, cultural and political fabric. Immigrants have high rates of citizenship acquisition, roughly 85% of those eligible to become citizens. Levels of political and civil, civic engagement are comparable to the Canadian-born population. Immigrants feel a strong sense of belonging and satisfaction about life in Canada. And there's a high level of social trust in cities with growing ethnically diverse populations. And immigrants have taken positions of political leadership and have thus shaped Canada over time. And moving forward, Canada will continue to take a balanced approach to immigration integration. It will reap the benefits of immigration through high levels of immigration and proactive supports to immigrant integration, including upholding its humanitarian commitments, while at the same time continue to take steps to maintain integrity and public confidence in its immigration system. However, Canada cannot rest on its laurels. There are challenges that remain to be addressed. More and more newcomers arrive with complex settlement needs, lower literacy, no or little knowledge of English or French, foreign credentials from different education systems, which thus increases the pressure on settlement and other public services. An evolving global context that gives rise to increasing numbers of displaced populations and vulnerable refugees will also challenge Canada's capacity to respond. And emerging threats to national security as a result of geopolitical dynamics can affect public confidence in Canada's approach to immigration and multiculturalism, and this will need to be managed. And finally, refugees who often arrive in Canada with no knowledge of English and French continue to have low economic outcomes with average employment earnings significantly below the Canadian average even 10 years after landing. All of that to say there is more work to be done. Thank you very much for the opportunity to outline Canada's approach. Thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador. It is certainly good to have um, how to say, realistic presentation of the situation. And what you said is, from one side, exactly the positive and beneficial effect of migration and or the phenomena of people move. But on the other side, also the responsibility that this is not an easy task. We all know from the experience in the past that it, uh, it takes more than one generation to somehow settle down and organize itself. We are now surprised by such a rapid and quick growth 
of migrants in the recent years, and certainly we cannot pretend to have an easy and quick an answer that could be applied everywhere in the world. But what we need is exactly what you said, no? to look positively and open-mindedly to the positive uh, side and also not to forget that it is a process. It is probably similar that any process of growing and educating that we go went through. We are, as a human being, we have to go through a difficult process of growing and becoming uh, responsible citizens. And I think also migration probably brings to our society a kind of the, uh, uh, task that we have to take this seriously. It is at least as difficult as educate, as grow up children, which are born in our, uh, probably is more difficult. So it means um, the realistic approach certainly helps us and encourages us really to, to maintain this uh, vision on future that is uh, going to stay with us for many years to come and many decades to come, it seems, and that we have to be prepared and we have to give an answer from our experience, from our teaching, from our spiritual inspiration. Thank you so much. So next uh, speaker does not need uh, any presentation Madame Carol Bachelor, Director of International Protection Department of the United Nations, High Commissioner of Refugees. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Archbishop, Your Eminence, fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you here today. When we talk about integration, it's interesting to consider uh, we heard words of inclusion, of belonging, of social cohesion, and we hear about ethnicity and religion and language and culture and tolerance and acceptance across these lines. I think it's also important to recall that not all persons on the move, whether they're migrants or, or refugees, uh, uh, come with the same experiences. We have people with different gender, people of different ages and needs. We have people with different degrees of vulnerabilities and certainly with extreme differences in uh, what they have experienced uh, that may have motivated them uh, to be uh, in situations of displacement or force them to be in situations of uh, fleeing from persecution. So I think it's important to remember this because in order to achieve integration, we need not to look at people only from large, the perspective of large blocks, but also as individual human beings. And I appreciated very much your eminence, your, your comments along that line. I think it's also important to recall then that when we say some of the priorities include education, uh, lawful stay, certainly for a refugee, a number one priority is to be identified in the first place as somebody who is in need of international protection. Uh, but the education and the job opportunities, this will vary depending on the individuals that we're speaking about. And it's important to identify those vulnerabilities and differences because by virtue of doing that, we can design programs and support systems and mechanisms that really will facilitate integration. And we've heard of success stories along this line. Well, I want to make six specific observations and give you some examples. Uh, we are talking about migrants today, and I would like to uh, also highlight the situation of refugees and UNHCR's experience in this regard. We note. Firstly, the principle of inclusion is central to integration. And as a first step, as I mentioned, it requires that refugees are counted. The work needed to achieve integration takes time and should start from the early stages of displacement. Nine out of the top 10 refugee hosting countries are in the developing region. Uh, when these ha uh, countries have shouldered the responsibility over decades for what is a global issue. Many developing states already support the integration of refugees through making employment and social opportunities accessible to them and including refugees in development programs, public planning, administrative records and censuses, 
and adopting legal and policy frameworks that facilitate equal enjoyment of rights and access to local systems and services. Some instructive examples include, in Latin America, the Cities of Solidarity Initiative, launched with the aim of ensuring the enjoyment of the rights of refugees in urban settings through the design and implementation of inclusive public policies and programs, a strengthened coordination of the different institutions and the promotion of livelihood projects. Also a, a good example in Iran, which of course has hosted a large number of Afghan refugees, these persons have been included into the national education and health services, including the health care insurance scheme. So these are the types of measures that support the fuller integration of refugees within the community. Secondly, Working with communities and understanding their priorities and perspectives and the challenges they face is crucial for any successful integration. The most important partners in promoting integration of forcibly displaced persons are actually the displaced persons themselves, along with the communities they live in. Thirdly, Promoting peaceful coexistence between displaced and local communities is one of UNHCR's global strategic priorities. Community-based approaches to protection provide opportunities for displaced and local communities to work together and to jointly identify concerns, design and implement activities which respond to these concerns. When an example in Brazil the municipality of Sao Paulo and the national government have created a conducive environment for refugee settlement through open dialogue between different actors, including government representatives, international organizations, civil society, migrants and refugees who discuss migration issues and work together. They actually develop together the migration and asylum policy and the national plan. And this is aligned with national laws and implementation of plans within these municipalities. A fourth observation. Integration requires the involvement of many actors. In countries of displacement, national and local governments, as well as civil society, play a key role in creating welcoming, inclusive societies and supporting social cohesion and refugee integration within host communities. We need to place local administrations at the center of coordination and action, reinforce local governance actors, and strengthen capacity on governance and rule of law, as well as taking a comprehensive approach to development aid and expanding partnerships and collaboration, for example, with the private sector and certainly with faith-based organizations. Some examples here. Authorities in urban contexts in Ecuador, Brazil, and Costa Rica have promoted integration by enrolling refugees in health, housing, and social safety net programs. In Lebanon, with financial support from the EC, UNHCR is working with local partners and the munici municipality to support improved access to water for over 200,000 Syrians and for the locally Lebanese population. A fifth observation. Experiences from resettlement countries have also shown that private and community engagement have not only expanded protection and solutions for refugees, but have contributed to foster public support for resettled refugees and welcoming communities. An example, and we've heard from the ambassador from Canada, uh, an illustration, private and community-based sponsorships in Canada and other countries, and initiatives such as the Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative have played a major role in supporting and hosting resettled refugees. These experiences can yield further dividends in expanding the role of local communities and private sponsors in supporting refugee integration. And finally, it's important that we continue to learn from these initiatives and to take time, as we are at today's event, to reflect on the advances we are making towards furthering integration for refugees and for migrants and overcoming the most pressing challenges 
towards achieving sustainable solutions for refugees in a spirit of global solidarity, international cooperation, and more equitable responsibility sharing. Finally, I'd like to just close with a question. We talk about integration, but we haven't really discussed in too much detail what we mean by integration into what exactly. I would note that our communities, our countries, they're not in the situation of remaining the same. And they shouldn't, that's not healthy. We need thriving economies, thriving uh, societies, thriving communities. We need not to be static. We need stability, but we cannot stay the same. Migrants, as we've heard so eloquently from other uh, panelists and from our keynote speaker, migrants and refugees contribute to advancing all of us uh, at the societal level, at the country level, regionally, and internationally. They represent an opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, certainly, your question at the end is um, somehow encouraging and also preoccupying. Uh, encouraging certainly that we have to be and I think this is very very normal that when we are speaking let's say the, the dynamic the, the society in which we live always needs a new idea new inspiration new generosity we have to look around to find those people who are able to do that and ready to do that and uh, often uh, we cannot spot them about the people who are well established and well off, living a good life, let's say so. So I think that this is already from purely practical point of view, educational point of view, how to say, to expect more dynamic approach, more will to start to do, to, to try to, uh, to do something better and more for the people who are coming, who go, went through enormously difficult period of, of, uh, of, of suffering, of, uh, of being treated improperly and so on. So uh, probably uh, this is the lesson we have to learn from your organization. And the Holy See certainly stands very much behind the principles that you are promoting. So we are coming, continuing with a uh, uh, couple of statements that we we are going to have from the floor, from the um, generous um, um, embassies and countries that were and institutions were co-sponsoring uh, co our event. I would pass the word to Ambassador of Order of Malta. Please, you have the floor. Thank you, Excellency. <clears throat> Your Eminence, distinguished pal panelists, dear colleagues and friends. One of the objectives of this event being to identify practical recommendations, allow me to share with you some good practices that the Order of Malta has established in Germany to improve the integration of refugees and migrants. Being responsible for more than 140 facilities with more than 44,000 migrants and refugees the Order has gained wide experience regarding this issue and has been playing an important role in the support of new arrivals. During the peak of the immigration, Malteser Germany had about 5,000 volunteers active. An additional 2,500 volunteers joined on a spontaneous basis. Volunteers, as we know, are a public expression with an impact on civil society. They are a message against defeatism. Following the first phase of emergency assistance, Malteser Germany created inter integration services to make migrants familiar with the German society and culture, such as religious tolerance, the role of women, the rule of law, and the like. These units also generated a platform for Germans to meet individual migrants, which in turn allowed for a totally different image of migration as opposed to fearing the influx of hundreds of thousands of foreigners. In the field of healthcare, the Order's medical foundation, Malteser Migrantenmedizin, 
provides free medical care for migrants, refugees, and others who cannot afford medical insurance in 18 cities across the country. Furthermore, during the high influxes in 2016, special medical services targeted against diseases that are typical for migrants and were set up. This field of activity that up to now has not been systematically developed may, however, need to be strengthened in the future. Some 40 special units for unaccompanied minors help children overcome the traumata of life-threatening experiences during their journey. Of particular interest among examples of a practical approach to support refugees in host countries is the innovative model of pilots for integration. Looking for a long-term solution to help integrating refugees and migrants more easily into society, Malteser has begun to employ and train so-called integration guides, which run over 80 groups spread across Germany, with 30 to 50 volunteers and one employed coordinator per group. Integration guides support migrants and refugees in overcoming challenges of daily life in their new host country, such as finding appropriate schools and childcare, learning German, making purchases, visiting doctors, communicating with governmental authorities, screening for job possibilities, and simply being part of society. Such interaction enables a both-sided exchange, giving refugees and migrants the possibility of being heard by having personal and familiar contacts, thereby safeguarding their dignity and ensuring the participation of local communities. It also enables them to learn by experience what open society means and to be part of it, as illustrated clearly by His Eminence earlier on. Furthermore, this kind of support by the civil society is transferable to governmental or institutional implementation in an engagement of private and public partnerships. Several German local and regional authorities have already adopted this approach to overcome language barriers with foreign language speaking people. I would like to conclude by referring to the now widely recognized special role of faith-based organizations and religious institutions in the protection and integration of migrants in host countries, as the Director of Protection has also just mentioned. Due to their local roots, they can be providers of both material and spiritual assistance. With its practical support, the Order of Malta therefore aims to combine a spiritual dimension so as to foster resilience and understanding between the different communities, such as by establishing a prayer room in every one of its facilities. These are just a few examples of innovative actions that the Order of Malta has introduced within its worldwide humanitarian activities to support populations on the move and to alleviate their suffering. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you so much. So I would give pass the word to another co-organizer of this event, uh, the International Catholic Migration Commission. Please, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> You've been so patient to listen to, to these um, to these panelists, and so I. Um, wonderful panelists with very interesting um, thought-provoking things to say. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be a part. And um, also, uh, Cardinal Marx, thanks. Uh, I'm just delighted to see you here. Um, I uh, used to live and work in Munich, and I know of your activities um, uh, with migrants. So it's good to, good to see you. Um, <clears throat> speaking as, um, as part of ICMC um, today, um, but also I'd like to share with you a little bit about um, some of my personal experience as, um, as a practitioner. So we're going to see this from a practitioner's point of view. Um, I, uh, about five years ago, I um, moved to Munich, and um, I was studying there at the LMU. Um, and at the same time, I uh, started my own business in uh, cultural integration for migrants called Cultural Integration Solutions. And so what I did is I provided direct assistance to migrants and to the organizations and local authorities and institutions that served them too. And so a few of my clients were the Bavarian Department of Labor and Industry, um, the LMU, and then Caritas München. 
And so um, I'm going to focus on uh, that client, uh, Caritas. Uh, so Norma, Norma Matere, was the director of the Migrationsdienst, or the Migration Services Unit, and she and I worked together, and as a consultant, um, she would refer migrants to me, and I would accompany them. Um, I would prepare them, I would coach them, I would accompany them and interpret for them um, at German uh, social service offices, like um, the Job Center or the, um, uh, the Department of Housing. And so uh, what we would do then is when in, in during those meetings, um, I would not only interpret, but I would sort of facilitate a kind of, I guess you would, might call it a negotiated um, agreement uh, in terms of social services packages. Um, and so uh, the, the language was German uh, throughout these um, uh, meetings. Uh, so anyway, uh, what I f I'll, I'll get to the point, and what I found in my work is it's really that personal accompaniment. Um, it's, it's really that m the migrants' exposure to people, to the systems in that country that seems to, in my opinion and in my work, accelerate the integration. Once they see what is expected of them, once they see how they have made a mistake and how they can do better the next time, it, is, it, is, um, it's, uh, it was to me very clear um, that that kind of personal accompaniment and that exposure uh, increased um, integration. So here's, a, I'll give you a brief example. So um, Caritas referred Salvatore to me. He was uh, from Calabria and uh, we, uh, he had an appointment at the job center. And um, so, you know, a couple of days before I prepare him, I tell him what the documents are to bring. Um, we go over the, uh, the address, uh, what time it is. Uh, so here the day comes, I'm sitting at the job center, 15 minutes goes by. Salvatore shows up 15 minutes late, bad. He shows up, no documents, what are you talking about? He, he comes dressed, um, you, you know, and not, uh, not looking very serious. And I'm thinking, this is, <laughs> this is going to get off to a bad start. So um, uh, graciously, though, the German civil servant welcomes uh, us into her office. And then in like a span of two minutes, she apprises the situation and uh, firmly um, tells us to basically get out of her office because we don't have um, the documents. We came late. Uh, this is not how we, you know, this, she can't work like this. Uh, she wasn't rude, but she was very clear. So uh, we walked out, and uh, you know, I think at that point, Salvatore learned that something was going wrong, and it's at that, at that moment then that I came in as that coach, explaining to him, hey, this is what went wrong, this is what we need to do better, you know, learning, 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 learning. So that, um, three weeks later, when we met again with the, the German social servant, she was very gracious to give us a second appointment. That doesn't always happen. Um, she gave us, um, so the three weeks later, um, two days before that, I call up Salvatore, I tell him the documents, I tell him what to do. He, at the day of the appointment, he comes 15 minutes early. He uh, brings more than the documents necessary. The man is wearing a suit. You know, he is ready to go. Bam, he learned immediately what to do. Um, and the, the, the meeting went very smoothly. Uh, he uh, received the social services that uh, we negotiated a, a very suitable um, social service package for him. And you'll never believe this, um, and it sounds so Pollyanna, but it actually happened. Um, at, the, at the end of the meeting, the, uh, the German social servant uh, uh, explained how the first time she went to Italy, you know, what that was like, how much she enjoyed it, um, and how um, she really wants to go back again, um, but she just needs the vacation time to go back. So she was talking about how much she just loved Italy. So it was so neat to see this kind of, you know, in the beginning, you know, that, that image of, you know, get out of my office, this can't work this way, to, oh my gosh, I'm loving Italy, I want to go back, let's make this work. So it was a very, very interesting that you're talking about that integration process where the two parts are coming together. I actually saw that. So it was really, really, really good. Um, so it's not just me. You know, I'm just one small little practitioner. The Maltese certainly are doing this in Ger Germany as well. Um, but ICMC also uh, does this. Um, 
uh, in Europe in cities in 27 countries through its SHARE program. Um, you've got uh, organizations, we've got our partners, you've got local authorities working together side by side directly with refugees in that integration process. Um, it's also in ICMC's uh, resettlement uh, support centers, working directly with refugees in the cultural orientation programs, again, helping refugees understand their new culture and what is expected of them. And it's truly in my work, what I've seen is that when, when, when the migrants understand clearly what is expected of them, they, in general, um, they general respond. I mean, not everyone, but in my work, I saw they very much, very much responded. Um, so I'm going to wrap it up because we've got to come to the end. And uh, what I'd like to say is, um, you know, sometimes the best solutions are the most human ones. This human accompaniment I'm talking about, so the most human ones. And uh, migrants can teach us that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the International Catholic Migration Commission and admiration for all the work they do. So we are continuing. If anybody has any co-sponsoring site would have something to say. I see the Philippines. Philippines. Good afternoon. Uh, I would like first by thanking our dear moderator, His Excellency Archbishop Djokovic. Uh, let me express also our appreciation <coughs> for the insightful remarks of the panelists. Indeed, we must all encourage integration of migrants. Their inclusion in host societies as one of the most fundamental positive actions must be undertaken in the face of the rising tide of xenophobia and anti-migrant sentiments. I say this confident that all of us in this room believe that migrants contribute positively to the economic development of their countries of origin and countries of destination. Furthermore, migrants can also help enrich and, and diversify their host communi communities to the benefit of all. This process should be welcomed as a positive development that would be greatly facilitated if host communities and their leaders would embrace the social and economic inclusion of migrants. This is, after all, a matter in the most basic terms of mutual respect of migrants for their hosts and of hosts for their migrant neighbors. I recall that social cohesion and inclusion are already affirmed in the New York Declaration. States have already committed to fully protect the safety, dignity, and human rights and fundamental freedoms of all migrants, regardless of their migratory status, as rights holders and in full respect for international human rights law and other relevant standards. In that same declaration, states strongly condemned acts and manifestations of racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance against migrants, and the stereotypes often applied to them. They also pledged to combat, with all the means at their disposal, the abuses and exploitation suffered by migrants in vulnerable situations, and address their special needs in accordance with obligations under the international law. Allow me also to note that it is my country's migrants' experience that they become more productive in contributing to the economic development of their host communities when they and their families are socially integrated and are allowed access to economic resources, particularly to financial resources. If we want social inclusion and cohesion, host societies must learn how to recognize and appreciate the overwhelming positive contribution of migrants. Host societies must value migrants. At the same time, migrants must take serious efforts to take advantage of opportunities provided for inclusion. It is in this context that the GCM, with the New York Declaration as its baseline aspirations framework, should be a document that advances in concrete terms social cohesion and economic inclusion of migrants and their families, regardless of their migration status in host societies. It is a truism that it is through social cohesion and economic inclusion that the human rights of migrants are best protected and fulfilled. In closing, allow me to submit some recommendations that my country believes should be included in the GCM. First, we should encourage the positive institutional role of local governments like cities, provinces and sub-national uh, government units, which can play 
critical roles in the economic and social inclusion of migrants and members of their families. Number two, we should ensure that employment contracts are fair, transparent, and verifiable, and are designed to promote decent work. Third, we should establish and enhance mechanisms for mutual skills recognition and qualification frameworks between sending and hosting societies. Fourth, we should implement the employer pays principle in the recruitment of migrant workers. And finally, fifth, we should guarantee access of migrants to basic services, such as education and health, regardless of their status, paying particular attention to those in vulnerable situations, such as women and unaccompanied minors. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. We are really we are very living with very little, little time. So I see European Union, probably we will finish with the statement of European Union, unfortunately. Uh, please, European Union. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chair, Your Eminence, um, Excellencies, I want to thank the distinguished panelists for their impetus and rich deliberations. We thank the Holy See for hosting this side event, which the EU is glad to co-sponsor. We would like to re reaffirm the importance of integration and social economic inclusion of legally staying migrants. Clearly, the cost of non-inclusion exceeds the cost of inclusion. Local authorities have an important role to play and require support in this regard. It is important to ensure access to basic services with particular reference to access to education, healthcare, justice, and language training. We also need to pay particular attention to the application of legally staying migrant workers. These pillars were flagged already by His Eminence Cardinal Marx earlier. The integration and social inclusion particularly requires substantial contributions of civil society, diaspora-led organizations, the private sector, media, academia, as well as social partners. Large movements of migration should be addressed from the needs-based perspective underpinned by a rights-based approach encompassing all human rights. Women and women leaders in migrant communities have a significant contribution to make. We should ensure their full, equal and meaningful participation in the development of local solutions and opportunities. Since 2016, the EU has in place an action plan on integration of third country nationals. This action plan assists migrant member states with concrete measures in five areas that are crucial for integration, pre-departure measures, education and training, access to basic services, labor market integration and vocational training. Also in December 2016, the Council of the EU adopted conclusions on the integration of third country nationals legally residing in the EU. The European Integration Network started its mutual learning activities in February. Several Commission services are working to explore possibilities um, to publish more data on immigrants' integration. And the um, Asylum and Migration Fund budget for integration for 2017 was increased by 150 million euros. To conclude, Mr. Chair, I just want to point out that integration is indeed, as was mentioned by the panel, a dynamic two-way process of mutual accommodation by all migrants and residents of member states. It encompasses elements of participation, interaction and cohesion by legally staying migrants and receiving societies. Thus, it aims at facilitating equal enjoyment of human rights and fundamental freedoms. I thank you very much. Thank you so much, European Union. Thank you for your co-sponsoring our event. It is certainly a very, um, how to say, authoritative, um, uh, your voice, and uh, we are really thankful to you. We have a little, little bit of time left. So a little, one minute to Caritas Internationalis and one minute more at the end, okay? Caritas, one minute, and then. Thank you, uh, his, uh, Your Excellency Jorkovic. Um, just to add, like one issue that you you discuss here, that I'm and we as Caritas International is totally agree on that, is that integration goes beyond participation and inclusion. Is uh, the sense of being part of the community. And on that matter, I would like to share with you uh, the new campaign launched globally speaking as Caritas International is called the Share the Journey campaign with two main objectives. This campaign has. Been 
in large, globally speaking, in all the regions all over the world. This campaign has two main objectives, uh, is to raise awareness of the culture of encounter that you also spoke about, uh, with a focus on the myths surrounding migration, as well as the causes and efforts of forced migration. And finally, to mobilize communities to increase spaces and opportunities for migrants and communities to come together. So I wanted to share with you this, this campaign. Thank you, Ms. Mm, Your Excellency. Thank you so much. So later we have to give a work for Afri Association Africaine d'Education pour le Développement. Ici représenté par Monsieur le Président de l'Association. Mais pour s'il vous plaît, brièvement, essentiellement. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Je pense que je ne sais pas si vous m'écoutez. Voilà. Monsieur, monsieur le Président, j'ai vu que justement l'Afrique est absente dans ces salles. C'est pour ça que je voulais prendre la parole. Je voulais féliciter l'Observateur de saint siège auprès des Nations Unies à Genève. Depuis l'élection du pape François, le Vatican est devenu un centre mondial de la défense des droits ou même de s'opprimer. Les messages du pape François sont clairs et sans ambiguïté. Le pape François, il presse avec des exemples très concrets. Lui-même, je pense, se considère comme pauvre. Je ne suis plus quelqu'un d'important, je ne suis pas important, mais permettez-moi quand même de faire une petite recommandation. J'aimerais que la prochaine fois que vous organisez un événement comme l'événement d'aujourd'hui, je vous propose de que les victimes prennent aussi la parole. On est fatigué de parler à notre nom. Nous avons aussi la possibilité de dire ce que nous passe avec nous. Les migrants venus d'Afrique, les migrants venus d'Amérique latine et d'Asie doivent aussi avoir la parole dans ce sens. Je voulais aussi féliciter le peuple allemand avec la bonne direction d'Angela Merkel, qui a été une femme courageuse, qui avait accepté, malgré les critiques d'une partie de sa société, les réfugiés en 2015, 2016 et jusqu'à aujourd'hui. Même si je devais, je devais dire à Mme Merkel, même si une partie de la société allemande de critique, le monde entier la mire pour la courageuse, pour, pour être courageuse, et que c'est un pays d'Europe occidentale qui presse les droits de l'homme, qui presse la liberté fondamentale. Mme Merkel ne dit pas ça, mais il agit. Nous félicitons à ces dames. Je voulais également féliciter le gouvernement du Canada pour que le Canada a montré que son ministre de l'Intégration vient d'Érythrée. Vient C'est une Érythréenne. C'est une affaire aussi très concrète. Ce n'est pas une théorie. Mais en ce qui concerne l'Afrique du Nord, c'est ça que je voulais parler aujourd'hui. L'Afrique du Nord, ça veut dire que les Marocaines, les Tunisiennes, les Azériennes, les Libyennes, les Égyptiennes, ils ont une attitude très ambiguë. D'un côté, ils défendent les immigrants qui sont en France, en Grande-Bretagne, en Belgique, en Allemagne, et d'autre côté, oppriment les immigrants qui viennent d'Afrique occidentale et d'Afrique orientale. Je voulais parler ici des discriminations raciales au Maroc, des discriminations raciales en Algérie, l'esclavage en Libye, qui est un crime contre l'humanité. Je espère que la communauté internationale, comme crime contre l'humanité, va appliquer les lois que nous avons depuis 1945, des lois contre l'humanité, des esclavages en Libye. Je vous remercie, Monsieur le Président. Thank you so much. It is certainly was very important to listen to you and to 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 listen also to these words that could be that are probably not often or sufficiently 
left and presented to the public and general opinion. I think we are very close to the end. I would like to thank to everybody today present with us, especially co-organizers, co-sponsoring state, graciously uh, uh, kind with us, uh, German ambassador and a fantastic dinner and a side event which we have with dinner. It was a kind of a second uh, version of side event. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody who was uh, participating today for you sharing with us uh, the vision. And I would give the word of final uh, remarks to see his eminence and uh, thanking him again for his presence with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your participation, for this uh, debate. Also to hear the statements is a little bit of debate. You have different points of views. You see that this uh, subject of migration, of integration, is, is a large subject. Just the beginning, I say, uh, sometimes it's not the end. We are not planning the end of these problems. We are perhaps beginning to to understand that is a large and a, a, a widespread problem for the next years and uh, for this century. We cannot influence all the catastrophes of the world and, and the, the wars and all the tensions who are on the base uh, uh, of, of migration and, ref uh, and refugees. But I think we have to, to make more. And these organizations like here in Geneva and, 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 and in New York and the United Nations and all the other organizations and the Catholic Church, they want to underline we will have no future when we are not able to see the common good of, the, of all people, not only looking on our special problems, but looking on the consequences uh, for, uh, for, for, the whole, uh, uh, for, the, for the whole of this planet. The, the Pope is always uh, speaking of one house of the creation. I think that's the beginning. When we are not able to look on the, uh, on the family of human beings, that we are in solidarity uh, together, uh, then we will not uh, have uh, solutions for our problems. We have to think also of our own interests, that's clear, but not alone. And that is, uh, for me, very uh, difficult to see that we are going back in some tendencies I can see going back to national interest to to the closer closer uh, visions uh, to look on on the on their own profits and not to, uh, to to see that also in this policy of, of uh, uh, migration and refugees we will only come forward when we see how can we create a situation that nearly the refugees the host uh, societies and also the so societies where, go, where they go out, they can be also winners of the situation a little bit to, to see the advantages, to, to come together forward. Otherwise, they, that will be difficult. But you see, when I uh, began, uh, begin uh, again with, with these subjects, that's very close to my heart, also for the Conference of Bishops in Germany, we will we will uh, help and we will uh, be very active in this, uh, in this subject uh, in Germany and in Europe. And the Catholic Church is there in a the very clear line with Pope Francis to be on your side in all these questions. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody, we just finished with the remark that uh, um, uh, panel ministerial on migration, envir environment, and climate change is starting at 3 o'clock. Thank you again.